The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. Dare to Dream is ranked in the top 100 best podcasts in USA in self-improvement on Apple Podcasts and ranks in the top 50 podcasts globally. Debbie Dashinger is a certified coach whose expertise is visibility in media. She coaches people to write a page turner book, takes their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and Debbie pulls back the curtain so her clients have the system to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. Connect with Debbie Dashinger at debbiedashinger.com. That's D E B B I D A C H I N G E R.com. The Dare to Dream podcast is sponsored by Dr. Dane Here and Access Consciousness. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And today I'm going to be bringing you a conversation that I think is really relevant right now. And specifically what I feel is relevant is like, what the heck does success mean in these interesting times? I know a lot of my colleagues are sort of bumping about figuring it out. Some say, oh my God, it's all about list building. Some say, no, no, it's really important to just give it away. Some say, I'm doing really well. And some say, where's unemployment? (laughs) So it's all over the map. And there's a lot of people who are weighing in about, this is what I've been doing? Is this really what I've been wanting to do? Who am I? And who have I been wanting to be? And these people are feeling called more than ever. You may find you're one of what I named or an amalgam of what I just talked about. Welcome to Dare to Dream because we're going to be deep diving with my friend and colleague, Deborah Poneman. And my question to you is, how would you like to meet somebody who's traveling the world, sharing the universal secrets of how to live a life of true and lasting success? Perfect. Because Deborah Poneman is here to talk about just that. She is a best-selling author. She's also the founder of Yes to Success Seminars. And for over 40 years, Deborah has shared her system, now used by tens of thousands all over the world, to create lives of success and prosperity. Some of these names who have taken her courses would really surprise you and impress you. They've learned about prosperity, deep happiness, self-love, and lasting inner fulfillment. She is known as the mentor to the mentors for the most renowned, and her teachings have become and allowed people to become mega successful entrepreneurs and renowned transformational leaders, New York Times bestselling authors, millionaires, billionaires, and powerful world changers. Deborah feels that her greatest accomplishment, her greatest accomplishment is not just that she has taught so many people how to live their dreams, but also how to look in the mirror and love the person that they see. And I'm going to be giving out a link. I recommend you hold on to this link in your head or write it down because Deborah's going to be offering you her book for free today. And her website as well as her free ebook is at yes to success 2020.com slash Deb on the radio. Again, that's yes to success 2020.com slash Deb on the radio. And just know that I will be saying it again a little later. And I welcome the beautiful Deborah Poneman to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Deb. Any excuse to spend some time with you, I would jump at. And now, and we also have thousands of people joining us in our little tete-a-tete, which we always love. When we see each other, we're like, Deb, Deb, Deb. And everybody looks over at us like, those girls are really kind of silly. (laughs) You're one of the few people who calls me Debs. I love it. When you email me, that's what I grew up hearing. And what I love about you being here, I don't know the timing exactly, but I've been doing the show 13 years So it's easily 12 years-ish 
since you were last on the show. So that makes me feel like this is so auspicious, a time in your life, in the planet's life, and that's where I want to start. Because I was talking about success, and yes to success, of course, when you began it in the 1980s, oh, that meant one thing. Besides the shoulder pads and the big hair and the belts, success meant one thing. Now, today, with everything going on, completely different vibe. It's interesting. So I would like you to start there. Bring us up to date. What is success about? What does it mean? What does it look like in your expertise? Oh, Debs, that is such a broad question. And I will give you a very unbroad answer. Success is about liking yourself. Here's the deal. As you said, I've been teaching success for 40 years and I have helped people become millionaires. I have helped people become billionaires and even household names. But the truth is, is that if you don't have success on the inside, if you don't have inner silence, if you don't have inner fulfillment, if you can't look in the mirror and love the person that you see, all of those things, you know they're just going to lead to despair. It's kind of like I have friends who have beautiful, gorgeous houses and you walk into their house or they walk into their house and it's like a Hollywood movie set. There's nothing on the other side because the emptiness oh. is in their hearts. What a way to describe that. That was really good. You walk in and it's a facade. Wow. Because the inner is not going on. Okay, that's deep. So you're saying aligning with who you are, with appreciating, loving, standing for yourself, that's big. Um, with what you're teaching, with what you're launching into, which you have just revamped everything and you're bringing it back around, how did you even deal with retooling something from 40 years ago, bringing it up to date and making it a really now movement? Well, when I started my company in uh, 1980, and I'll just tell you a little bit of the Cliff's Notes version of how I started it so that what I'm doing now makes more sense. When I started in 1980, I had already been a teacher of Transcendental Meditation for 10 years. And I had spent much of that time, months at a time, uh, meditating eight to 10 hours a day in silence for weeks at a time or else at the feet of the master Maharishi Mahashogi and teaching over a thousand people how to do TM. And at the end of the decade, I realized that woman does not live by mantra alone. <laughs> and I needed some money. I needed some health insurance and car insurance and maybe a car to insure would be really <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, and you will love this part. I thought to myself, I was living in a meditation community in Fairfield, Iowa, and I thought to myself, okay, I got to make some money. Where do people live who have a lot of money and what do they do? So I thought, LA. <laughs> I'm going to go to LA and I'm going to sell investments because I knew some people who had done that. Wow. So literally, I packed my bags and probably only in one bag, moved to LA, started selling investments. I was a dismal failure. As a matter of fact, month after month went by, I didn't sell anything. But you know the expression, we make plans and God laughs. Well, God had a big yuck over me going to LA to make money. But also, we're always divinely led. And one night when my colleague said, do you want to go to a money seminar with me? I said, I'll do anything to be better at what I do. But it was at the learning annex. What do I know? I don't know what the learning annex is. I walk in. It's not what I expected, you know, the suits. It was the new age crowd. And this is 1980. And the man was talking about the law of attraction. And he's saying that however we vibrate, that's what we draw into our lives. So if we're vibrating poverty by talking about, I'll never get out of debt, the economy's so bad, I'll, you know, I look at these homes in LA, I'll never have one of those. We vibrate with that and that's what we draw into our lives. But no matter what our state of affairs, if we talk about the Mercedes we're going to drive and the house we're going to live in and how great things are getting, but really deeply believe it and, you know, do some other techniques like giving, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and tithing, which is always a good idea to give 10% to the source of your spiritual inspiration, mm -hmm. um, that you will vibrate with a higher vibration and attract prosperity into your life. Well, and, and that was just, you know, two minutes of a 
to our presentation, but everything he said resonated with me so profoundly that I went back the next morning, I quit my job, and I started studying the great masters of success and prosperity. So what happened was that I didn't know that all of this knowledge existed. Napoleon Hill and Wallace Waddles and Emmett Fox and the Church of Religious Science and Florence Kovalshin. I was like a kid mm. in a candy store. And I put together a seminar and I used the techniques that I was learning from these great masters on how to be successful to create my, my company. And to make that part of the story, which is quite long, quite short, when I went into the Santa Monica Public Library, which I had rented for my presentation, uh, it was standing room only. So, and that was the beginning of my career. So now to get to the answer to your question, I always taught about success being living your truth. Hmm. I always taught success being living in integrity. I always taught that success is not denying your intuition, but I always taught that success is living from your heart and not from your head. And the beautiful thing about it is that that's how you get the Mercedes and the big house and the fancy car. But the difference is, is that when you do walk through the house, the door of that beautiful house, mm. you feel full inside. And you can enjoy the beauty because you don't feel like you're an imposter. Yeah. So what kind of techniques, when people do your Yes to Success program today, are the techniques the same as the principles you're talking about from these great masters? Or are they, I'm guessing they have to be because these are tried and true, right? These aren't uh, trendy at all. However, is your course now imbued with the last 40 years because you've been around, girl, you've been doing some big, big things, year of miracles and many different courses and collaborations with big, well-known people out in the world. I'm assuming all these principles have become this beautiful, magical soup. Talk a little bit about some of the techniques and the ways that you offer people assistance with their challenges so they can be a hell yes to success. Okay, so it's such a great question because I did, my, my seminar became mega successful. Within a few years, it was being taught, and this is in the 80s, in um, seven countries on four continents. And that was when we communicated with phones, with those curly cords that were attached to the walls, you know? <laughs> in this thing called mail <laughs> and um there was there weren't even uh what do you call those things fax machines back then <laughs> but it, i still managed to get it in all of those countries and the seminar became bigger and bigger and you know the who's who of transformational leaders were my uh students marcy shimoff was my secretary janet atwood was my personal assistant i was about to have my own day daytime tv talk show my book was in the hands of a new york publisher but one of the techniques that I teach is to, you have to live your truth. And my truth hit me like a ton of bricks. And that's why people have heard those names and probably not mine, because in 1988, my daughter was born mm -hmm. and I was on this mega trajectory towards success. And when she was born, I thought, I don't want to go tape a TV show. I don't want to go on a book tour. I don't want to leave her to go to the bathroom. I was supposed to do a, a, a tour of Southeast Asia. And I remember calling the guy, Chiang. He was, he actually called me. He said, hey, you're, you're the baby. Let's get this tour set up. And I said, Chiang, you're going to have to call me back in 18 years. <laughs> and he remembers it. He, we're still friends. And it turned into 21 years after my son was born. Because here's the thing, Deb. I taught people to follow their heart. And if my heart was home with my little girl and I was going around the world, my authenticity meter would have been way over in the negative range. And you know, as well as I do, you could smell inauthenticity a mile away and more now than ever. And people do not want to learn from a teacher who is not living his or her teaching. They run in the other, other direction. We have that intuition now. We are not stupid. We are not going to be fooled. And I didn't want to fool anybody and keep putting a smile on my face and traveling around the world when all I wanted to do was to be 
you know, at Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> with my kids, even though they had bad pizza. So I stayed at home for 21 years. And people say, oh, you gave it all up. I didn't give up anything. Mm -hmm. First of all, everybody is born with a dharma, what we are put on earth to do. Mm -hmm. And if you take away a year to be with your mother while she's making her transition, if mm -hmm. you take out you know, two years to go hold AIDS babies in Uganda, if you take out four months to go work on a political campaign, or in my case, 21 years to be home with your children, your dharma is not going to go away. It's what you were put on earth to do. Like your dharma, Deb, you are so good at what you do. Obviously, it's your gift. Your mm. gift is not going to go away. So I knew if I stayed home for 21 years, I know I'm supposed to be a speaker. I know I'm supposed to be a teacher. But here's the answer to your question. How my teaching changed? I spent 21 years learning from my two greatest teachers and those are the teachers who call me mom mm -hmm. and if you want to know something that i've learned that has enriched my teaching can i just share with you something i learned from my son of course i've heard about him over the years you bring me up to date okay so you know that daniel always loved basketball he he was shooting hoops before he could practically stand and when all the other little boys wanted to go to chuck e cheese for their fifth birthday he insisted we go to michael jordan's restaurant <laughs> the other kids didn't know what was going on but he wanted michael jordan's restaurant anyway as he grew older uh he his love for basketball only increased and when he was a freshman in high school he made the a team Unfortunately, he was only one of two or three white kids on the team. And let me tell you, white boys decidedly cannot jump. <laughs> and he sat on the bench the whole time. Uh. But he noticed that he had, a, he had an eye for talent. They would travel all over, over Chicago and he could point out who was gonna get drafted by the division one schools, who would even go into the leagues one day. And he started at the age of 14 or 15, a high school basketball website. And it became so popular with college coaches, he would highlight players in the Chicago area, that he became the go-to scout in Chicago for college coaches. There is a full page article in, in Sports Illustrated about him when he was 16, why college hoops coaches seek the advice of a 16 year old scout. Wow. So now what I learned from him, which is one of the most important techniques of success, I teach it in every one of my seminars, so Daniel came to us one day, to my husband and myself, and said, you know, guys, he didn't call us guys, I say guys, you know, mom and dad, I am not, he was getting people scholarships because he would make films of these kids and he would send them off to the college coaches. He said, I'm not doing this best enough, number one. And number two, the people like Derek Rose don't need me. It's the division two kids who need me. Those kids who would slip under the radar because nobody's really recruiting them. I want to start putting on showcases that highlight Division II kids. We never discouraged our kids. However big their dream was, however crazy it was, we said, if the creator gave you that dream, because I believe the creator whispers in your ear what needs to be done, okay, Daniel, I need you to do that. Whispers in Daniel's ear. And if Daniel didn't do it, the creator would just give it to somebody else. Sure. But we said to Daniel, you go for it. So his first showcase had... 10 coaches and 30 kids and he generated a couple college scholarships and now 10 years later he um his last showcase he had 360 kids and 140 college coaches and to date he has generated over 50 million dollars in college scholarships for kids in the inner city of chicago what is his title right now well, he, his nonprofit is Shot in the Dark Foundation. So he's, he started that nonprofit 10 years ago with his first showcase. Because one of the things I left out, the reason why these kids were never seen is because people asked them to pay $150 or $250 to be in a showcase. Daniel had the idea to start a nonprofit, collect money from mostly my friends, and, and put on free showcases for the kids. That's why they couldn't be seen. They don't have $250. As a matter of fact, some of the kids, you know, we had to go pick them up. We had to help them get there because even bus fare was a stretch. But here's the principle that I learned from Daniel. 
So Daniel's generating millions of dollars in scholarships. And I say to him, Daniel, isn't there a way that you can make some money from this? Because he wouldn't take a penny. It all went to the kids mm -hmm. and putting on the showcases. And I said, Daniel, there has to be some way. And he says, mom, just be patient. I'm building relationship capital. I love him. <laughs> right? And then, you know, more time would go by and he was generating more and more millions of dollars. And I say, Daniel, I mean, can't you figure out some way? He says, mom, you just have to trust me. I'm building relationship capital. It's the most valuable capital in the long run. It's yeah. much more valuable than any dollars that I could be making. So I said, okay, I trust you. Well, again, a long story short, but he had this idea that he wanted to make a documentary on basketball in Chicago and show the truth about how basketball is the only way out for a lot of these kids. And one of the people who he did nothing for except because relationship capital is doing things without any thought of return, just giving because it's your nature to give and because you want to help. One of the people who he built relationship capital with gave him almost a half a million dollars to make his movie and it ended up being a phenomenon getting nominated for an Emmy Award for best long form sports documentary. Well, There's I saw more. it twice. Can you tell people the name of it if they'd like to look it up? Because it's really yes. worth seeing. Thank you. It's Shot in the Dark. In the, and it's called Shot in the Dark because, well, three things. One is because of the expression that, you know, these kids have a, as much of a chance of making it as a shot in the dark. But the reason why it's so powerful, well, you know what? Maybe I won't give it away, but one of the main characters gets um, shot somebody who was like a son to me he didn't die but just watch the movie and you'll see what happens but it's it's all real it is real i was with them every step of the way during the filming it's all real and um and the other thing that i wanted to say is that when i said to daniel about you got to make some money for yourself he actually came to that conclusion because he was sleeping on our couch and he said, you know what, mom, I think what I should do is start my own sports agency. And again, we you never describe <laughs> right? It's like, okay, you want to do it? He went to another one of the people who he had built relationship capital with who gave him millions of dollars to wow. start, start his own sports agency. And now this little kid, he's 27, well, actually, he's 28 years old and he has like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine agents working for him in his agency. It's called Beyond Athlete Management, beyond.am. And um, he is partners with Jeff Soros, you know, from the Soros family. Is he still Jeff, based out of Chicago? Huh? Is he still based out of Chicago? Yeah, but he comes to LA a lot because LA Media Fund, which is um, Jeff's organization, uh, is in LA. So Daniel goes out a lot to, uh, that's where the partners are located. And, um, but again, he just gave me in that, and okay, and here's a sequel to the story because there is an end to this. So I said to him, Daniel, thank you so much for that concept of relationship capital. I teach it to all my students and they love it. And just thank you for teaching it to me. And he looks at me, he goes, mom, what are you talking about? I said, you know, relationship capital. He goes, well, I learned it from you. You just didn't call it that. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you always taught and, you're, and you think your kids aren't listening, right? Mm -hmm. He said, I heard you teaching your seminars and you would always say, you have to treat everybody as the most important person in the world. The person standing in front of you at any given moment is the most important person world at that moment and they deserve to be treated that way. And don't go looking around the room to see if there's somebody more important to talk to. And I heard you teaching that. And the end of my story is I did do that. And he says, and you know what happened with Marcy? Well, Marcy Shimoff, when she was a little bouncy, adorable college student, took my Yes to Success seminar, came up at the end, said, I want to work for you. I want to work for you. Could I be your secretary? And I'm, I don't know her. And, but of course, I treated her like the most important person in the world. I heard her out and I hired her. And 
so many blessings have come from that relationship because she did become the number one nonfiction female author of all times, selling 16 million chicken soup books and happy for no reason and love for no reason and being a star of the secret. And after my 21 year hiatus of being home with the kids, who do you think grabbed me right up and said, you're back, come on, let's do this together. And besides that, when I was home with the kids, she was asked to, to write chicken soup for the American Idol Soul and she couldn't because she was under contract for happy for no reason but they said to her do you know anybody who knows american idol backwards and forwards and who is a great author and she said yes i do and i was handed a best-selling book to write because i had built relationship capital mm -hmm. it combined the number one book series of all times and the number one tv nonfiction book series and the number one tv show of all time into one book Besides the fact that it was a blast interviewing all the idols and the producers and the directors and the judges and being backstage and, you know, being BFFs with Stephen Tyler and, you know, and in the old days, Paula and Randy and even Simon, who happens to be a very nice guy, all because I built relationship capital, all because I treated somebody who was standing in front of me is the most important person in the world. 100%. So those are the kinds of things I learned from my kids that I now incorporate into my teaching. Yeah, and it, I know that what Daniel said to you, your son, has to be accurate because there is no way a human being surrenders their career for 21 years, over two decades, and then says, yeah, I think I'll step back onto the stage in transformation. And it wasn't like you had to claw your way back and beg and, you know, try to figure your way or struggle or effort. Bam. I mean, you're so well connected with the right people. You are just back in a whole new flow doing something aligned with your heart and truth. So I know this is true about you. And I want to say I love this story because it illustrates something that I'm really curious about regarding you. And I hope you'll pull back the curtain a little deeply here for me, which is I've known you, whatever, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And you don't know, but in the background, when I observe you, there's always, there's so many things I admire. One thing that is a little mind blowing to me is your willingness to use your voice. And sometimes at times when nobody else is, and I'll give you an example. You and I were once in a room in an intimate setting-ish, and it was um, sort of a mastermind meeting-ish. And um, somebody at one of the tables, one of the members was speaking, and somebody who was running it uh, was say, speaking to this woman in a way that frankly was untoward. It was very rough. It was a little uncalled for. It was a little shocking. And I feel like most people in the room were just sort of like, whoa, that's really an interesting exchange going on. But, you know, person at the front of the room is acting like this. And I think most of us would have let it just happen and go on. And literally from out of the back of the room, you stood up and in a really firm, clear way, no yelling, no shouting, but really clearly said, I do not see this person as that. And I don't feel that this exchange is actually productive. And you frankly called her out in a way that I think she was able to save face, but you really stood for an underdog at an important time. I've seen this quality in you over the years over and over again. I find it riveting and it's really edifying. Like, wow, if we all chose to use our voice like that, how important. What is that? Because it takes cojones at a time when everyone else is being quiet, that woo, you rise to the occasion. What is that that lets you know now, right? Now is the moment. And that allows you with such power, but gentle power to express yourself in that way. Well, thank you, Deb, for um, remembering that. I have to say, I, I don't remember that particular situation because I have done that <laughs> several times. And first of all, I can't stand injustice. 
I just, that's why what's going on in the world right now is just, yes, yes. We are all holding hands and we are all saying no more injustice. It doesn't work. This world doesn't work if it just works for some and it doesn't work for everyone. And it's just, I am so optimistic about what's going on right now. And I know this is, I'll, I'll give you the answer, but I mean, I marched on Washington in 1969 and I was there, you know, I was there for the Women's March. I was there for Obama's inauguration. I was there, I was there, I was there. My, my parents took me when the, when the, um, uh, what was that group when the Nazis tried to march in Skokie when I was this big they took my hand and brought me to the march <laughs> for the American Civil Liberties Union where it was letting the Nazis march in Skokie and um, so I have always always tried to, to fight for justice but it's always been a fringe movement and I think we got it this time I sorry I think that the, the whole world and, and and I'll tell you something Debs you know I know I'm a privileged white woman I know that I don't really know what's going on. I don't have black skin, I don't have brown skin, but I know that it's not enough to just write my check to the Southern Poverty Law Center and think that I did my part. It doesn't work anymore. To do our parts, what we have to do now is we have to, I say we have to put our lives on the line. We have to go out and we have to be on the front lines. And, we, and the other thing we have to do is we have to educate ourselves so we know what's useful and the other thing which is such a something that we need to be successful we can't be afraid of other people's opinions and when i realized that the reason why we hold back is because we are afraid that we're not going to look good because we think that oh i don't know i what are they going to think of me if if i speak up you know what don't flatter yourself. Nobody cares that much about you. They're, they're too busy worrying about what other people are thinking about them to think about you. But I mean, thank you for remembering that I did that. But, you know, when you're just living your life trying to please other people, you are going to go to your grave. You'll be on your deathbed and you'll think, I blew it this lifetime. So here's what I want to tell you why I'm able to do that. There's a concept in Kabbalah, in the Jewish mystical text. And the concept is called tikkun, yes. T-I-K-K-U-N, and it means repair. It's what did we get born into this lifetime to repair? What character trait did we not get right the last time around that we now have another chance to get it straight? And believe it or not, Deb, mine was not speaking up. Mine was, um, you know, I was one of those people that if... I like really hot soup, but if the waiter brought me lukewarm soup, I would never send it back. God forbid I should ruffle any feathers or I should hurt the feelings of the waiter. But that same situation, not speaking up, showed up over and over and over. It was my tacoon. And when I decided that I don't want to come back again in my next lifetime and have to do the whole the same thing over because it's going to be harder next time. If you don't face your tacoon the first time in this lifetime, it gets harder and it gets harder and it gets harder. So I did it. I spoke up once. And then I spoke up again, and then I spoke up again. And now it's just second nature. It wasn't easy because it is my tacoon. It was my tacoon. And I say to whoever is listening, what is it that you are afraid to do? Okay, it's not that big a deal. It's like the first time you ever jumped off a high dive. You were so petrified. You went to the edge of the board, then went back, then you went to the edge and you went back. And finally you just ran and you held your nose and you into the water. <laughs> it was no big deal. You did it again and again and again because it was so much fun. My tacoon was speaking up. And the more you face your tacoon, the easier it becomes. And the other thing is all of the success and all of the grace that you want in your life is waiting for you on the other side of facing your tacoon. Mm. That is so beautiful. And I love the fact that it just wasn't, oh yeah, I've been doing that my whole life. Always had a mouth since the time I was a little girl. No, it was like, I recognize this is actually absent in my life and it's impacting me and my relationship. So. I'm sure you were quaking the first time, but it's eloquent, I could say, from somebody who's experienced it many times. Oh, I want to be clear, Deborah does not stand up at every event, but it really has been at times when a voice is needed. 
And it has been just so illuminating to me. It's something I will always carry forward. Um, you know, it's a reference point. And so, and I want to use like pieces of what you're talking about, because earlier on you said giving, tithing, really important. One of the principles you talk about, Daniel used it in his business. One of the ways you give back to your soul so that you get it this way is tikkun, is to say, no, I have a voice for the underdog. There is no injustice in my world that I won't speak to or show up for, which is beautiful. How do you recommend people in their own worlds give and tithe and show up that way? Well, I'll give you, I'm going to give everybody a technique. Okay. Good technique. Yeah. All right. You know how people say Neil Donald Walsh got messages from God and they just gobble up his books because he got messages from God. Guys, you get the same messages from God every minute of every day. There is no difference between you and Neil Donald Walsh. Do you think that God is only going to talk to Neil Donald Walsh? I think I'll just talk to Neil Donald Walsh and a couple random saints. No. The difference is that he got those messages and he sat down and he wrote them out at his computer and he put them into a book and he does it every day and he sends out his daily message. If you want to know how you can contribute, if you want to know how you can make your life better, if you want to know, ask your partner. And that's the God of your understanding. And the God of your understanding is different for some people will, will say, Jesus, what should I do today? Other people will say, I don't know, Krishna, what should I do today? The one God. But the truth is, is that not only do we have God, we have our guardian angels. We have all kinds of helpers that are at the ready to help us, to give us the messages that we need to be who we are supposed to be in this world. I call it sitting for grace. I got this. I heard this first from Napoleon Hill in his book, Think and Grow Rich. He attributes all of his success to doing what he calls sitting for ideas. He sits down every morning. He puts at the top of a page, God, what are you and I going to do today? And then he just writes and whatever flows out, he doesn't censor it. He just lets that light come in and through his heart and out through his arm on the paper. And I'll tell you, if you want an answer, just ask your partners, ask your angels, ask God. And you could do it as soon as we are, are done with this interview, sit down, take out a piece of paper. How am I meant to contribute to the world? And it's not a thinking exercise. I call it taking dictation from God. It's not a thinking exercise. It's taking dictation. And, and if it seems like it's just gobbledygook, just keep writing, just keep writing. And if you stop, say, what else? If you stop again, say, what else do you need me to know? And at the end, maybe five, 10 minutes, read it over and you will have a blueprint for what you need in your own life. I can't tell you what tools and techniques you need to make your life fantastic, but you, I mean, I could try, but you can tell you what tools and techniques you need to make your life fantastic. Try it. I promise you will be so amazed at how brilliant you are and how all the answers are inside yourself. Yeah, so you clearly did the same because you let a lot of information flow through you into an ebook that you've put out and you're really generously offering to those listening and watching as a gift, your ebook. Tell us about the ebook. I'm going to give out the URL now. I'll give it out again later so people can get this in their brain, but it's yes to success 2020com slash Deb on the radio. And tell me about this uh, secret book that you've got going. Okay, so it's so great that you asked me because, I mean, it's so great that you said that I must have had that book come through me because I never say that, <laughs> but it's the truth. I usually say, oh, I wrote this book because you know, not every audience can handle that the book came through me, but your audience sure can. So anyway, what happened was that, remember the beginning of my story where I told you that my book was in the hands of a New York publisher. Actually, there were two New York publishers, both of whom wanted to publish my book. That's when my baby was born. And I said, uh, sorry, 
I'll see you in 21 years. But by the time that was, um, the 21 years had passed, I wasn't really in a space that I wanted to take the time to rewrite the book. However, people keep asking me, when are you gonna write a book? When are you gonna write a book? When are you gonna write a book? Put your knowledge in a book. And one day I thought, you know what? I'll just write an ebook. So what I decided to do was to take the five secrets, my five best secrets to how to create a successful life and write it in a book that people could read in 15 minutes. It's not 100 pages. It's like 40 pages with lots of pictures. There's a picture of me and my son. There's a story about me and Marcy Shimoff one day when we were driving across a Brooklyn Bridge, what happened, and pictures of, uh, I talk about what I learned from my first teacher, Maharishi Mahashogi, that totally changed the face of how I enter into relationships now. And um, five secrets and they are there in this ebook the five secrets to a life of true success and i love that book because i read it and i get re-reminded of how i need to course correct mm -hmm. to stay in the path to my own success we always have to keep course correcting and that book is that lighthouse for me mm -hmm. go toward the lighthouse that's beautiful and what is the name of it the five secrets to a life of true success. Great. So folks, you can go to yes to success 2020.com slash Deb on the radio. I just want to, you haven't gloated at all, but I think I'm going to give you a little license to just, you know, in a sentence gloat. I know one of your students, uh, besides some of who you've named was Deepak Chopra. Can you just name a few other people who have taken the yes to success seminars? Well, Deepak took it actually three times. Well, twice, and then he had me come to his house and do a private one for his family, his extended family. That was fun back in the 80s. Steve Farber from Extreme Leadership, who just had a best-selling book, Love is Just Damn Good Business. He was one of my students. As a matter of fact, okay, this is really cool. It's more than a minute, but when he took my Yes to Success seminar, we do a lot of sharing when we do it live, which probably isn't going to happen for another few years, but I do teach it online. But he stood up and he was so magnetic when he was just sharing something in the uh, seminar. And I stopped him in sentence. I said, you have to be a professional speaker. He said, oh, no, not me. Uh, he was selling investments at the time. He, huh. he worked for a financial company. <laughs> it seems to be contagious. I said, no, I'm telling you, you have got to be, you have the charisma, you have the looks, you have the humor, you have last month or maybe it was two months ago he was named by the huffington post as the number one business speaker in the u.s that's so great isn't that fabulous another one of my students is jeffrey smith you know who is the foremost authority on gmos in the world mm -hmm. and he always talks about how it, yes to success he got his head on straight as to what he wanted to accomplish um we have phil town who was um he is the new york times number one best-selling author of rule number one and payback time he was a student of mine so do you want me to keep going or yeah just say a few more because i think this is important for people to evaluate where they are and see some of these luminaries that they may say, oh, I, I've heard them speak on stage or I follow them or, you know, I, I know what kind of influencer they are. I aspire to that as well in my realm. So yes, please. Well, Janet Atwood, it's a great story. Um, Janet attended one of my seminars and she was broke and homeless at the time. Did you know that, Deb? No. And homeless she was jumping over fences to take showers in somebody's pool house she was actually sleeping on the floor of the tm center because she, she had no place to live and she saw a poster for my yes to success and it just she had one of those boy you know moments and she borrowed the money and she came to the seminar and she sat in the front row and i teach how to manifest if you have a dream i will teach you how to manifest your dream and her dream was to do what i'm doing she wanted to be a speaker. She got that when she was sitting there and she came up to me. She actually gave me a ride to the airport in her car slash home. And she, um, and I said to her, what's your dream? And she said, 
well, first I want to become one of your, your first trainer, and then I want to do what you're doing for myself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I said, well, you're going to have to attend my seminar at least a half a dozen more times. And a few weeks later, she just manifested using the tools that I taught. She's sitting in the TM center doing her meditation, and she feels something fall, like pieces of paper falling on her head. And somebody gave her, I don't know how many, but many, many, many hundred dollar bills and said, when she opened her eyes and she was surrounded by hundred dollar bills, they said, Janet, go live your dream. And that gave her the money to follow me from Boston to Washington, DC, to New York, to Orlando, Florida, to Chicago, all the places I was teaching. And then I hired her and she became my first trainer. And the passion test was born at a Yes to Success seminar while she was doing the technique that I just shared with your listeners. She had the, um, it just came out, the passion test. And then it just channeled through her what the passion test was supposed to be. And that was the beginning of her. I mean, she, the passion test is the number one tool being used worldwide for, to help people discover their passions. And it was born at the Us to Success Seminar. Oh, and I love these stories because they're so dear to dream stories, dear to dr create your dreams into your reality. So this is, right? This is really I have whatever. David Adelson was one of my students. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Of course, didn't know that. And But I did know that he also lived in Fairfield, Iowa for a time. And he's a friend of mine. And we've hung out for the past couple of years. And I, he's a genius. And folks, if, if you're curious about what we're, some of you may say, oh, yeah, yeah, he was on the show. I heard his interview. I mean, this guy, he's a quantum unified field inventor. And I can tell you from experiencing his inventions, this is for real, this stuff. Very powerful. Um, so yes, he was also somebody who went to Deborah's seminars. And I, I didn't even know until he was on the show. And she saw and put that together for us. But I, I'm going to tell you the most fabulous story. I love him so much. Fabulous story. So he was married, um, and I, I think she changed. Well, her name is Allura now, but anyway, the gorgeous woman. They're they're not together anymore. But I know just, her. I <laughs> know her. You have to love her. But anyway, so they were married, and they had a little boy. So we were living in Fairfield, Iowa, and he was a baby. He was maybe I don't know, maybe eight months old. Would and that be we David? Were, I mean, would that be Eli? Eli. Yeah. Eli. Yes. So Eli was a tiny little baby. And um, we had to go get these badges because when we lived in Fairfield, Iowa, we would go meditate together in these big golden domes. We had to get a badge for entry. And they, were, they had to go upstairs to get their badges and left Eli in the arms of like some babysitter. And Eli was like screaming his head up, like the whole room, like, oh my God, calm that kid down. He was so loud. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go over and, and, and just, you know, calm somebody down here. Uh, and I said to the babysitter, do you mind? Maybe I could hold him. And his head just like whipped around and he reached out to me. I had never seen this baby before in my life. And I took him in my arms and he snuggles me and I'm talking to him. And when, when um, David and Laura came down after they had gotten their badge, I told them what happened. And they looked at each other and they said, when he was in the womb, they listened to my Yes to Success tapes over and over and over. That's crazy. He recognized my voice. And your vibration, clearly. What? Oh, my God. I'm friends with them. So I got to tell you, and this baby that you helped calm down and who knew you and was drawn to you, He's become such an extraordinary man. He's handsome. He's a world traveler. He's doing great business things. He works with his dad. I will absolutely have to pass this on. It's such a beautiful, small world. I love this. I love that you know that whole gorgeous family. I, I had no idea what Eli had done, was doing. I knew him when I saw him grow up to about five years old, but then we moved away from Fairfield. So... It's so exciting, and he's working with his dad. Oh, that's a whole nother conversation. I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah, we'll have to all reconnect. Um, so I want to hearken back to something that has to do with Fairfield. I mean, typically, I might ask you, what's your one ritual or practice you do every day? But I know. And I just want to preface this by saying, 
that um, easily 10 years ago, I was so struggling. I was trying to figure out like, God, how do I just still this brain of mine 24 seven? And I was trying all sorts of things. And God was not talking to me at that point, <laughs> but I wasn't writing either. I wasn't doing the technique. I was trying to figure it out, figure it out. And man, I remember calling you and I just said, all right, like I surrender. Can you help me? Because I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do, but I want this. And you said, I got you, girl. And you sent me to the, the center here in Los Angeles with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. And I took a course. I mean, it was the most beautiful experience of my life. I was so deeply, I was like 100% in, you know? And then I got to go to some of the Sri Sri things through you, with you. Um, that was magnificent. It was such a turning point for me to learn. So talk about meditation. What is that to you? You're not, I'm assuming, doing eight, 10 hours anymore because you're a busy woman. <laughs> you're a busy, successful, yes to success woman. What is that? Because I know you're still very much committed to that in your life. Yes, and I still teach. I don't teach through the TM organization because in 1993, I kind of jumped ship. And I still love TM, and I, uh, so many of my friends are TM teachers. But um, the reason why I started teaching through Art of Living is because uh, I love that they also are so involved in humanitarian projects around the world. And um, they are they go into villages in India and help them get clean water. And they're really passionate about non-GMO and, you know, they fight for the farmers. And I I think I want to be over there with them. <laughs> and they also have the meditation techniques. But um, I believe that trying to build a life of success without meditation, without something that silences the mind and creates that inner fullness and that inner silence is like trying to build a building without a foundation. Yeah. It's just going to crumble. And the deeper the foundation, the taller the building that you can build. And I believe it's like that with our lives, the deeper the silence. And you say I'm a busy woman and I'm not doing eight, 10 hours a day. Well, obviously I'm not, but I still love the expression that if you're too busy to meditate for 10 minutes, then meditate for an hour. Because what I find, and I still do, you know, I'm in the middle right now, I, I'm launching Yes to Success again, and it's um, with all of the ancient principles that I've been teaching forever, but also some modern ones and those I learned from my kids. I am very busy right now, but I will never compromise. I will never miss my meditation. I don't think I've missed a meditation. I hate to admit this, but this, this year, well, no, I'm proud to admit it. I will have been meditating for 50 years this year. It's my 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. and I probably only missed a handful of meditations. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how people live without it. So there's the meditation. I also do the breath, breath program from the Art of Living Foundation. I don't know how people live without doing the breath, but I also have a clean diet. Here's the thing. There is so much outer noise. There's so much trying to knock us off center right now. We need to do those techniques. Amaji, the hugging saint said, the reason we have to cling to our spiritual practices is so that when the world shakes, we remain unshakable. Mm. So I believe that we have to do our meditation, even if it's you learn TM or you learn the art of living, Sahaj Samadhi meditation, just 20 minutes twice a day. But that's enough to make you unshakable if you want to add on the art of living breath practices or whatever. The reason why I name these as opposed to some others, which I'm sure are wonderful, is that these are the ones that have the most scientific research behind them, that they absolutely do de decrease anxiety, that they do um, uh, increase oxytocin, which is the happiness hormone. They decrease cortisol, which is the stress hormone. They, they turn around the aging process of the brain. Actually, there has been proof, scientific proof, that the Art of Living Breath Course, that it actually not only stops the aging process of the brain, but reverses the aging process of the brain, let alone your skin and your vigor and all of that. Hey, I mean, you could calculate how old I am if I've been meditating <laughs> for 50 years old, I've, for 50 years, I've been actually teaching meditation for 49. You know, I, I didn't get born and then, you know, 
pop out of my mom and start teaching, but meditation reverses the aging process. Again, we need some scientifically verified technique mm -hmm. to keep us centered, to keep us calm, to keep us clear, increases the brainwave coherence, and might I add, to keep us young. <laughs> to keep us young and unshakable. And these are really important words right now because with everything going on, it is just my sense it's not the end of the shaking, that there's more shaking until we really do start riding the ship. So this is a beautiful time to hear that, that you can have that anchor in your life. And that anchor is you inside of you, energetically holding you still. So we are at the end, but I do want, if you don't mind to just cliff note this succinctly, what will people get when they take yes to success with you? Why you, why now? What is the benefit rich idea for taking this? Well, I will tell you that who should not take it? Hmm. It's anybody who thinks it's going to be a quick fix because I've been teaching success now for 40 years to tens of thousands of people. And the truth is, is that there is a formula but it only works if you work it. If you wanna have a life that you love, if you wanna be able to look in the mirror and say, I love you, you are living a great life, you are a world changer. Again, we don't, it's not so much about your name being in lights, it's about you being a light, being a light for yourself, being a light for your family, being a light for your community, being a light in this world. So if you want, and yes, as we've said many times, my students have become multimillionaires, billionaires. I just bumped into a guy who I didn't even know took my seminar and said he became a billionaire using my techniques. But more importantly, at the end of my Yes to Success course, you love yourself. And you love your life no matter what happens. I'll add one thing. There is a point in my life where my husband and I had millions. And we lost those millions. Don't even, you know, avoid Ponzi schemes at all, at all costs. But you know what? It was just a blip on the screen because we still, and it wasn't like, oh, we still have ourselves. It was, well, that's perfect because we know that everything's perfect, but it can't be an intellectual concept. It's something you grow to live when you take the Yes to Success seminar. You grow to absolutely know in the deepest depths of your being that everything is exactly as it should be. Mm, fantastic. So folks, if you're interested, start with the ebook as Deborah Poneman's gift to you. Go to yes to success 2020com slash Deb on the radio. And my friend, I thank you so much for being the lighthouse you are out in the world and for coming on and sharing your wisdom today and your story. Thank you. And thank you. I can't even fathom how many lives you have changed for what from these shows that you've been doing and the knowledge you are, you are a lighthouse, but you're also that conduit to bring out the knowledge that all these people have to share. If it weren't for you, the world wouldn't have it mm -hmm. as powerfully or some in some cases have it at all. So thank you so much for uh, listening when God whispered in your ear mm -hmm. to start doing what you're doing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm honored. And folks, you want to tune in to the next shows on Dare to Dream, your number one weekly transformation conversation. Next week, shaman Heather Ash Amara will be here to share her wisdom. And then James Redfield, who is asked to come on four times. He feels like this time is so important. He wanted to break it down for the listeners and watchers four different times to start building a platform through this show of what is happening right now and what you need to know. If you're listening to the podcast and you love what you're hearing, but you'd really love to see myself and the guests, I hear people say it is a whole nother something something way to enjoy this show. Just go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and you get to see us animated and beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for listening and watching Dare to Dream and remember to create all your dreams into your reality.